Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of State of the Stallions. This is your host, Luke Miller, and I'm excited to be here yet another week. Got a great episode lined up for you today. Got a wonderful interview with Stallions defensive tackle Marvin Wilson, who's got an incredible story. Grew up in Texas, played college football at Florida State, overcame some challenges at the end of his time in college to eventually reach the pro level, but that sort of inhibited him from reaching all of his goals, and he's really trying to prove that he still got it and make a name for himself in the UFL this year. So I'm really excited for you to get the chance to hear from him at the end of the show. As we usually do, we'll have our roundup segment where I'll give you the latest news in the UFL. I'll talk about it more when we get there, but let me just go ahead and say I did drop an emergency episode this weekend on the Stallions roster. If you didn't know, the Stallions cut their roster down from 75 players to 58 players, meaning they let 17 players go over the weekend. And so there was a lot to talk about, decided to kind of spin it off and do a separate emergency episode. Would really encourage you to go back and listen to that if you haven't had the chance to yet, just to kind of hear about what players made the cut, what players did not, and maybe a little bit about what the philosophy was for some of those cuts. So Definitely go and check that out once you listen to this episode. But for now, get ready and get excited for another week of State of the Stallions. Here we go. Let's go. Get You can feel the buzz when you're around this city. People have fallen in love with the Birmingham Stallions. Welcome to State of the Stallions. Really excited to uh, be here for another episode and to have a, another great guest on. This week we have Marvin Wilson, Wilson, Stallions defensive tackle, defensive lineman with us. He was uh, willing to make some time to chat with us tonight, so really excited about that. Marvin, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. How about you? I'm I'm doing good. I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, he's just kind of talking before we we started this thing and um, I've had some some other players on here who have who have been in kind of spring football for a year or two, uh, but you're sort of new to this. So I'm excited to kind of hear what your experience has been and and, uh, you know, how how things have been going. But before we get to that, I want to jump too far ahead. I just wanted to kind of um, start by asking you, um, you know, I was doing a little research before this and I know um, you're a Texas guy. So you're from uh, Houston area. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, coming out of high school, you were one of the biggest pro, um, prospects in the country. Um, you know, you were the number one player in Texas, which that in and of itself is a feat because uh, we know about the quality of players in Texas. I was talking to one of them last week and Chris Orr, and then you're also mm -hmm. the number one defensive tackle in the country. And uh, interestingly though, as a Texas guy, you ended up at Florida state, which, you know, kind of surprised me a little bit. I mean, you could have gone anywhere you wanted to go. And uh, out of mm -hmm. all the places that were out there, you know, anybody would have taken you, but you decided to, to go to Florida State. So I was curious if you could tell us, you know, go back in time a little bit and tell us a little bit more about kind of what that was like and, and your your experience kind of uh, choosing to go to Florida State and playing college football there. Um, I mean, it was a lot that went into it, honestly. Um, you know, my, a lot of people don't remember, like, going into uh, that 2016 season. I graduated in 2017. We're going into that 2016 season. It was a lot that was going on throughout college football, a lot of coaching changes, you know, let's know, so that, back then there's no such thing as transfer port or anything. Yeah. So it's like, my mindset, when you go somewhere, you're stuck there, you know, yeah. like you're doing your four, four to five years, however many it is at that school, you know? So, um, and I remember coming out, I think all the majority of Texas schools uh, back then were either going through a coaching change, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, so that kind of eliminated a lot of different things for me because like going in, I didn't want to go be a part of, you know, a coaching change, you know, you, yeah. you know, you, we had so many got different uh, coaches that got fired, like Charlie Strong had got fired, uh, Summer had got fired at a and you know, so like that was like a big hit because like at the time, right before I made my decision, I think they hired a new coach in January, like late January, you know, signing days February 1st back then, so yeah. like that's a that's a huge leap of faith just to go uh, go go to some school you're unfamiliar with. I remember uh, LSU was in my top five as well. That's back when I think he less less miles has retired. Yep. You know, and, um, just before that, named Ed Ogeron as the head coach. You know, um, so it really everything started pointing to that was making sense at the time. Was Florida State, 
you know, so uh, Byron had a great relationship with uh, Jimbo Fisher. You know, Odell Higgins and Tim Brewster at the time was recruiting me real hard. And it just, to me, it just made sense. You know, um, a lot of people outside looking in couldn't understand, but it's like, you have a guy like Odell Higgins that's always been there. You know, um, a lot of people don't understand when they're going to recruit me. A lot of people get associated with all the different things. Looking around, like, it's your, your position coach is going to spend the most time with more yeah. than anything. You know, and especially in a, at that time of college football, everybody, that's when I feel like the phase of it, coaches started jumping around, getting different jobs. It really started to pick up around that time. Mm-hmm. And so I won't, I'm, I trust that he's going to be there uh, no matter what. So i um, end up taking my talents to Tallahassee. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And uh, I know, uh, you know, the majority of people that listen to this show, you know, are probably obviously more inclined to follow Alabama, Auburn, some schools like that. But I know we do got some a few Florida State supporters out there, too, especially, you know, in lower Alabama. So I know they'll be, be excited to hear from you. But um, but thanks for sharing that. I know, you know, coming out of college, um, it was kind of a crazy time for you at the end when it all happened. Cause I know um, I, I might get the dates mixed up here, but I can't remember if it was your, I think maybe your junior year, um, you know, you were really highly touted prospect, had an awesome season. You know, there was a lot of talk that maybe, you, you know, mm-hmm. you're looking at being a first round draft pick and all this kind of thing. And then, you know, COVID happened. I think, you know, there was maybe an injury in going to your last year at Florida state and all that kind of thing. And that, mm-hmm. that really sort of, um, you know, kind of derailed, you know, how things have been trending up to that point. So, you know, what was it like sort of making that transition out of college after all of that craziness and chaos, both just, you know, kind of in, in your own kind of personal life with, you know, dealing with injuries and, and, you know, all the, obviously you talked about stability, but coaching changes and all that kind of stuff. Um, in addition to obviously the world was dealing with its own kind of craziness and chaos. Yeah with with covid and then you know also i mean i uh you know i know you've talked a lot about this so um we can maybe say this for another another episode but i know you were at the forefront of advocating for some change and uh for for just more representation and justice especially for black players in college football you know so there's just i mean I, I imagine that was a very kind of crazy time in your life and then all of a sudden you're trying to transition into to making this your career as a professional football player you know because you're you're doing this pre pre nil days you know so uh, yeah. What was that kind of season of your life like? I mean, I know I'm sure there's a lot you could say, but but maybe give us a little insight into what it was like walking through all that. Um, honestly, it was a wild time, you know. Um, just so leading up to that junior year, after that junior season, you know, we already had went through one coach change and then going through another one, um, going to my senior year, still coming off a hand injury because I ended up uh, breaking my thumb going into, uh, at the end of my junior season, coming off trying to rehab that, and then COVID hits. You know, we was just started getting uh, acclimated with Coach Norville at the time. And um, go through that injury, come back, trying to train with your guys out of, of basically, you know, um, a garage, trying to get ready for the season. You know, COVID's at the time, we had no contact, no access to the facility, things like that. Besides, like, us trying to sneak in at night, you know, basically breaking into our own facility just to get some work <laughs> in, you know, so – Hopping the gates and uh, getting some work in, and trying to use sleds and different things like that in uh, and Florida State. So it was a very wild time, and then going through a a, a long extended camp, and then just getting a, a getting a tweaking injury that just worsened throughout the season. You know, and just a lot of things got derailed. You know, and over time, it's like um, just something that weighed weighed on my mental for a long time because it was like, dang, how can something everything seems so promising change so fast? You know, and um. So getting into the league and realizing how rough on draft a free agent has it, man, it's like, it's, it was just, it weighed on my mental a lot because it was like, dang, I wasn't even supposed to be here. Yeah. You know, and um, being able to fight from the bottom and trying to get to the top, you know, and um, it was a long, strenuous process, you know, and like, honestly, like, now I'm probably like the healthiest I've been in a long time, you yeah. know, and um, now it's, it feels good to be out there, go out of practice, display who I really am, you know, even though having a year off of football, you know, being released last spring, and getting back into, you know, just not necessarily football shape, but getting back to, you know, your tactics, it feels so great to be able to have this opportunity to go back to show the world what I really can do. Yeah, absolutely. And we're certainly glad that you got this opportunity and excited to see you out there. And I was kind of curious, you know, I know you, you spent some time in the NFL, especially with the Eagles. And then mm-hmm. uh, when you were released by them, you know, a little bit after that, you decided to join the USFL. And initially, you were signed by the Philadelphia Stars, but you sort of got immediately traded to the Stallions. So 
was was you know how were you kind of notified about all that was were you kind of expecting to be up with the stallions all along or was it sort of like you got one call that was like hey we signed you and then another call that we traded you a minute later or you know what was that i mean that whole time was kind of crazy because the merger was about to happen and all that kind of yeah. stuff but this was slightly before then but um what was it sort of like of, of kind of finding your place in the usfl which has now become the ufl um at the time i was talking to the philly uh philly stars and uh birmingham at the time and you know um it just it was just going back and forth with both, and um, back then I realized they had a rule towards there's like um if I signed with the team, I mean I couldn't sign with a team outside of uh that basically like the jurisdiction. So I got released to Philly, so I'm automatically until January first. Yeah, supposed to be with I, Philly could sign me, you know, and I, unless I unless I waited out until January first and I could sign with Birmingham, you know, who obviously seemed more desirable, you know, two time champ, supposed to, yeah. you know, so pump the most guys back into the NFL. But at the same time, it was like um. Talking with Zach, like he wanted to trade for a couple of and send them a couple of offensive linemen because at the time I feel like they needed the, the help. And um, yeah, so um, it literally, so it was basically like bam, bam, I was notified at the time of how things were going to transpire. And so I was okay with it. Like, this is who I always wanted to be with from the jump, you know. And um, just the, that's the thing about just pro football, you know, you don't always get to go where the team wants to, you yeah. know, the way you desire to be. So it just, I was just, I prayed a lot about it. It just all worked out in my favor. Yeah, no, that's awesome, and uh, we're we're glad that it did work out that way, and we we were able to get you in the door, especially before all the craziness of the merger happened, and there was a lot of you know shuffling around and moving moving pieces pieces and parts then. But um, you know, how's it been so far with training camp? Um, you know, as we kind of we talked about earlier, this is your first kind of spring football experience. You've been in the NFL the last couple of years, so you know, just in terms of you know how it compares and. Uh, you know, the players that you're around, the level of competition, the coaching. I mean, what have maybe been some things you've kind of noticed or observed the first couple of weeks of camp? Well, the first couple of weeks of camp is not that huge of a drop off, in my opinion. You know, yep. um, it's a lot of talented guys in this league, you know, and um, a lot of NFL talent, talented, I mean, caliber guys is in this league. So, so far, my uh, my thoughts on the UFL is like, um, I feel like this spring, spring football is here to stay. You know, they mm. keep producing this amount of talent. Um, having the background and having a fan base and everything, I feel I definitely feel like ten years from now we'll still be seeing spring football around. You know this league because it just um the competition level is everything. Everything that I thought it was gonna be plus on um, plus some more. You yeah. know, and so far I've, I've been I've been enjoying every single step of the way. You know, we're in camp right now. Camp is camp. You know, no matter where you go, <laughs> camp is all it's always gonna be a grind. And right now we're starting to get to the dog days of camp where we're just going every single day. You know, yep. it was cut down the roster, so things are starting to pick up on refs and things like that. So now we're starting to feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, on that note, congratulations on making it through the the first round of cuts. I mean, um, you you with like you mentioned, with the level of talent that we have, you know, you you kind of you kind of can maybe speculate or guess. I mean, as a as more of a fan or, you know, someone who follows the league, it's like I could kind of guess. I'm not there at camp every day, so I don't know what it's like on the inside per se. But, you know, you you might have an idea. Well, I think maybe this guy's got a good shot to make it or maybe not that guy. But you never really know, you know. And um, obviously with how talented the roster was, like some good players were going to get cut. I mean, there's just no way around that. So, I mean, the fact that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they they saw what you've been doing and, and – you know, said they want to, they they want you to be a part of this next season. I mean, that's certainly uh, deserving of some some congratulations. So, congrats on that. And I was curious, um, you know, how has it been working with specifically? You mentioned, you know, your position coach earlier is who you end up spending the most time with. But how's it been working with Bill Johnson? I mean, he's a guy with a lot. Uh, I think out of everybody on the Stallion staff, the most NFL experience. Like I think eighteen seasons in the NFL, and then. You know, he was also at LSU when they won the national championship. And I think this is like his, I don't know, like 45th year coaching or something crazy. Um, you know, he's mm -hmm. he's been coaching for, uh, you know, much longer than I've been alive. Don't tell him I said that. But, um, you know, like <laughs> what, what's it been like kind of working with him and, uh, you know, getting to be around him? I mean, he's also been a guy that's been in the spring football space for a couple of years. He was with the Stallions two years ago, and then he was with an XFL team last year. So he kind of knows these, these sorts of leagues well. But how's it been kind of working with him and the other D linemen? Um, working with Bill's been fun. Bill brings the energy every moment of the day. You know, being an older guy, I would never find somebody to be so hyped at every moment of the day. You can tell he lives and breathes and he loves football. You know, and that just that's just something I, I, I'll i be ready to go see him every day, you know, we get to the meeting time because he just brings that fire. You know, he's ready, he's ready to get – always, always ready to get better every single day. You know, so um, that really has been great. He's been teaching me a lot of different things about efficient movement. Uh, just working on my hands, being better, being better, um, 
a better football player. So I've learned a lot of things, a lot of different things from Bill so far, and he's just been, a, you know, really just a great advocate for the for the game of football so far. Being here with the guys and working on this and just telling us the key things we need to uh, keep getting better at every single day. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, I was curious, um, you know, you kind of mentioned a little bit about you know your familiarity with the Stallions and kind of the success that they'd had in the past. And um, both in terms of on the field and then sending players back to the NFL. I mean, one guy that comes to mind is Khalil Davis. I know you're, you know, you're playing mm-hmm. with his twin brother right now, but you know, he was a guy that that came to the Stallions last year and uh, was was really dominant in the reps that he got, and you know, just signed a, a contract after kind of working his yeah. way into the, the main rotation on the Texans, and um, that you know they they inked to deal with him to to keep him around after him kind of showing what he could do. So um, all that to say, I mean. You know, I'm curious to hear what, what your experience has been like sort of with the Stallions culture, you know, being there for the first couple of weeks and, and in what ways you want to kind of contribute to that and kind of continue to help develop and grow that sort of winning culture and successful culture, both in terms of of players individually, individually sort of accomplishing their goals, but then obviously sort of the big goals of the team of, you know, this team has never not won a championship since they've been around, you know, in the last last uh, mm-hmm. in the last two years. You know what I mean? So there's there's a lot of expectations and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a high standard that's sort of been held. So what's it been like to sort of be a part of that? Um, so far, it's just been coming over, come ready to work every single day. You know, every, we just we, we know what the end goal is. But at the same time, we, we ain't going to get there. We, gonna, we aren't going to get to June if we don't take care of March right now. Yeah. So every single day we've been putting in the work doing the little things and just listening to our coaches. You know, that's the biggest part about everything so far is being able to take each day, not looking not looking to next week, not looking to two weeks from now, not looking to March 30th. You know, so right now we gotta just be where our feet are and just take take everything one step at a time. You know, and we know what the end goal is. So so far we have to work to the end goal. We can't skip steps. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean for you personally, you know, um obviously, you know, kind of like I've alluded to throughout talking about this, when you sort of look at your story and look at how dominant of a player you've been throughout your career, you know, I'm sure this is probably not a spot you never, you never like necessarily expect or see yourself in a spot like this, right. Um, When you're, you know, dominating at the college level and you're thinking about what it's going to, what's going to be sort of next. Um, And and on paper, you're not one of the, you're not one of the guys that really should be in this league in a sense, right? Like you obviously have the talent and the experience to be playing at the highest level, not, not in any way a knock on the UFL because as we've already talked about, I mean, we could really say this about almost all the guys in this league, all of the guys in this league for one reason or another, you know, mm-hmm. either have been or could be in the NFL. But whether it's an injury, whether it was just, you know, wrong time, wrong place, whatever the case may be, like guys end up falling through the cracks and, um, you know, are looking for that sort of second opportunity or that that chance to kind of, you know, I mean, I, we saw it last year with with the Stallions, with Alex Magoo, our quarterback, right? He was a seventh yeah. round draft pick, kind of bounced around. And kind of just got buried on depth charts and then was kind of forgotten about and then came and showed, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, against NFL quality players how dominant he could be. And obviously, you know, he could kind of pick where he went after that in terms of of NFL opportunities. So, I mean, for you personally, obviously, you know, there's the team goals and that's what's most important and the championship and all those kinds of things. But, you know, do you feel like you have a chip on your shoulder or something to prove this kind of season or, or, you know, um, you know, what are, what are some, what's kind of your mindset, I guess, going into, into this UFL season? Uh, first, I want to say I just I am thankful just to be in the UFL at the same time. Is that where, where I want to be? No, not at all. But at the same time, I'm still able to still one play the game that I love too. Still have opportunity to go out there and prove who I am. And um, so more than anything, this year um, with the UFL, my my personal goal is just one, make it through the season healthy, put great tape out, you know, and dominate competition. You know, those those are three goals that I have myself. It's not really just necessarily. I send all American teams and things like that. That matter. I handle business every day uh, going forward. You know, um, all, a lot of that stuff will come with it. You know, I know what my end goal is is to get back to where I want to be, but where everybody in this league desires to be. Right. So um, that's pretty. That's pretty much w- what it is. You know, um, and I'm around a, a lot of great talent, and like, especially this defense. Um, we on a great defense that's fully loaded with so much talent. And some guys are deserving the opportunity that haven't got the opportunity yet either. So um, we're really just ready to go out there with the guys and really just dominate. So and just see how this thing unravels for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think one of the things that I've kind of noticed um, about these leagues is, um, and this is true of, of all sports, you know, and it's true of football at any level, right? But like team success breeds individual success. And, you know, I know there was a lot of um, 
great players from other USFL mm -hmm. teams last year that weren't on the Stallions that were frustrated because all these Stallions just kept getting signed to the NFL. Um, but mm -hmm. when you're the best and, you know, you've, you've dominated every other team, like there's, you know, people are going to take notice of, of the players that are sort of making that happen. So I know, you know, all of you guys are, are sort of in this together and, um, the better you all do as a team and the better you all do individually, it's sort of, you know, everything kind of comes together. I mean, the last couple of years have, have sort of proven that, I think, for the Stallions. But um, mm -hmm. Marvin, man, it's been really great, great talking to you. I just got one more question for you. Um, uh, you know, the Stallions, it's kind of a weird setup this year because I know you weren't around the last two years, but the last two years, the team was spending almost all their time in Birmingham. Like the first year the USL yeah. existed, they were always in Birmingham all the time, every game. And then last year they were still there, you know, the majority of the time this year, things have kind of changed where, you know, y'all are, are in Texas, mm -hmm. you know, out where you're from, but obviously you'll still be getting to play at, at home. And you've got a couple of weeks for that kind of first home game to sort of build up, you know, a couple of road games. And then you'll finally get that, that home night game, the third week of, se of the season against, you know, uh, a kind of local rival in a way, Memphis. So, I was just curious if you sort of have any kind of message to the the Stallions fans or, you know, kind of the city of Birmingham, you know, that that first uh, game at Protect will be your first chance to play there and in front mm -hmm. of the sort of Stallions nation. So, um, you know, would love to hear kind of anything you want to want to share with them as we, you know, I don't want to jump too far ahead because I know we got a couple games to take care of business before that. But that's, a, that's only about yeah. a month down the road. So we're, you know, it'll be here before we know it. I just want to tell Birmingham fans that um, I'm here to really come make a great impact. Show everybody why um, I was deserving of this opportunity to play for the two-time champs. And you're ready to come back and try to win a third one. You know, that's all I want to say. You know, we just, I'm trying to be a part of the greatness, trying to be a reason why we hold up another trophy. Absolutely, man. Well, uh, you're a guy that I know lots of people were really excited that we picked up this offseason. Uh, we know you got a lot of gas left in the tank, so we're really excited to to see that on the field. And um, you know, the Stallions defense was was good last year, but I know I talked to Zach Potter a couple of weeks ago, and then one of the things he said was, you know, this this offseason, Skip Holtz and I, we sat down and we really brainstormed how can we improve our defense because they felt like that was the area they really wanted to address. And so guys like yourself mm -hmm. were a big part of that. And um, so I know they're expecting a lot out of the defensive side of the ball this year, and we're certainly looking forward to to seeing you and all the other guys and what you do, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks here, here in Arlington. Certainly some of us will be here for that game, and we're excited to – kick off the season that way. And then certainly, you know, mm -hmm. back at home in Birmingham. So uh, Marvin, thanks again, man. I uh, can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. It's been a lot of fun. Hopefully we get the chance to do it again. And we certainly wish you the best uh, with camp, you know, stay healthy and uh, can't wait to see you out there on the field. So appreciate you, Luke. All right, folks. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Stein's defensive tackle, Marvin Wilson. As you could tell, he's got an incredible story and not only an incredible story, but he's an incredible talent. And I'm really excited Looking forward to seeing him on the field this year in the UFL, and hopefully we can get him on the podcast again in, in a few weeks and hear how things are going for him once the season actually begins. Now it's time for our weekly segment, The Roundup, where we go over all the latest news related to the Stallions as well as the rest of the UFL. We actually have quite a bit to talk about today. I tried to make sure I included everything I could and filled up the list here, but I probably even left one or two things out. There's just been a lot going on. Of course, we've kind of reached that point in camp and leading up to the season where uh, games are going to be in a couple weeks. Things are really ramping up. There's a lot happening. So I'm um, going to try and keep this brief, but there's a lot to go over. Um, the first thing that's worth mentioning is that the Stallions new uniforms were revealed last Wednesday. So right after the podcast episode came out last week, we got to see our first glimpse of the Stallions uniforms as well as the uniforms for all other eight teams. In case you didn't get the chance to see them, I'll put a picture of them on the screen here for you. But um, overall, I think the reception to the uniforms was was pretty positive. They pretty much, for the most part, kept things the same with some minor modifications. Um, the uniforms are being made by Under Armour, so that's definitely a big improvement from previous years. But I think overall, they played it safe, which was really the right move here. And I think people were, were generally pretty pleased with the uniforms. Also, when they released new uniforms, they also released new Under Armour merch in the UFL shop. So would definitely check that out if you're interested in that. There's a lot of uh, new Under Armour hats, shirts, hoodies, those sorts of things. There's also, I think, some additional new merch that isn't necessarily made by Under Armour. But that's something you might want to check out as we get closer to the season and uh, you get ready for, uh, you know, gearing up literally for uh, the Stallions 2024 campaign. Also, uh, another kind of interesting piece of roster news, the Stallions did make their first in-season trade. 
And they traded their offensive lineman, Jameer Johnson, to the defenders for a linebacker, Chauncey Rivers. So Jameer Johnson played for us last year. We actually picked him up from the New Jersey Generals, who he was with in 2022. He started at a lot of different points for our offensive line last year and was definitely a key contributor for us in making our way to the championship and winning that that championship, that second championship. Um, but the Steins brought in a lot of offensive linemen this year. It was a really competitive room. Um, he also suffered an injury towards the end of last season that took him out of the last few games. And I think he's fully recovered from that, but obviously you never know how that affects a player coming back from an injury and the shape that they're in and all those kinds of things. So he's an excellent player. Um, obviously that's the case because rather than just release him, the stands were able to sort of leverage him for a trade. Um, the defenders on their end, apparently for whatever reason, they had a great linebacker in Chauncey Rivers who they were potentially going to release or weren't going to be able to use. So I think it was sort of a mutually beneficial situation. Chauncey Rivers, you might actually recognize the name if you ever watched the show Last Chance U. He was on there in one of the seasons. He also played after that, uh, after his JUCO time at Mississippi State. So if you follow the SEC, you might remember him from that. Um, he's a big guy, 6'3", 275. He played defensive end more so in college. He's listed really as a linebacker, but he's kind of one of those hybrid edge guys who can play with his hand down potentially or standing up and brings a little bit different skill set, I think, to the Stallions linebacker room than some of the other guys we've got. So i um, interested to see, uh, you know, if he sort of makes it through the next round of cuts and if he, if he makes the roster, how the Stallions utilize him on defense. Another piece of roster news, um, legendary running back Bo Scarborough did announce his retirement on Friday, uh, this past Friday, March 8th. Um, I think it was pretty clear if you followed along with the Stallions, and I, I talked about this and. Um, the emergency podcast I put out over the weekend. But I think it was pretty clear that Bo was not, unfortunately, was not able to fully recover and heal up from his injury last year and the surgery he had to have on his knee. And um, he is getting older. He's 29, which is is not old. But, you know, for a running back, it's it's sort of getting up there in terms of the life expectancy of a running back in the professional football these days. And so I think uh, the writing was on the wall a little bit that that maybe his time had come. And after thinking through it and praying over it and talking with his friends and family and coaches and teammates, Bo decided that it was it was the right time to step away. And so I uh, just wanted to acknowledge him and um, actually wanted to include just a short snippet uh, from something that he shared at his press conference when he um, announced his retirement. I expect the same thing this year from you guys. I expect you guys to work harder. And, you know, I'm, this is going to be the last thing I'm going to say and I'm going to let you guys go. Win that f***ing now, a championship. That's what I want to see. And if, if y'all win it, I know y'all going to win. I ain't no ill fans to bust about that. Because this team that we have, we have a bunch of bullies. And when I say a bunch of bullies, a team with a mindset, they're ready to go play. Want to just say thank you to Bo, all he's meant for the state of Alabama, playing high school football here, college football here, and professional football here, bringing multiple championships at the college and professional level to the state of Alabama. Um, an incredible person, an incredible leader, so pivotal in sort of establishing the Stallions culture out the gate that first year. And um, he said he wants to get involved in football and, and specifically in player development and helping players to sort of reach their full potential on and off the field. And so hopefully he can do that with the Stallions or if, if not with us, then whoever gets him certainly going to benefit from his presence in the locker room and on the field and off the field. And so um, we love you, Bo. We're really thankful for you and uh, just really excited for this ne next chapter for you. Also, the Stallions had their scrimmage against the Battlehawks this past Saturday. By all accounts, from what I've been told, I think it was a very positive thing. It wasn't exactly a game sort of scrimmage, you know, where they did a full four quarters or something like that. So there wasn't really a, a score per se or a winner or loser. But um, I think the team got some really valuable reps in. Obviously, it probably helped the, the coaches make some roster decisions heading into the end of the weekend. And um, from what I was told, I, I think overall we looked really, really good and and – I think, uh, unsurprisingly, for the third year in a row, we have a really good team, and this this scrimmage against the Battlehawks confirmed that. Unfortunately, after that scrimmage, we did have to let go of 17 players. I mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, but um, there was so much to talk about that. Rather than include it in this week's episode, I decided to spin off a separate emergency episode that I released over the weekend that's about a half an hour. And um, in order for me to be able to cover all of the cuts and what happened, I, I decided to go that route. So if you haven't listened to that yet, I would highly encourage you to go listen to it. If you want to know who made the cuts, who's in, who's out, again, why maybe the coaches decided to keep certain players and let other players go. I kind of went through all of that for every position in that emergency podcast episode. So if you haven't listened to that, definitely go check it out. 
Um, just for the, you know, for those of you who are watching this, I'll go ahead and put up a picture of the players who were cut so you can see those. There definitely were some surprises. I think, for example, Calvin Ashley, all USFL linemen that we picked up from the, the New Jersey Generals. It might be a familiar name because he actually spent some time at Auburn in college. Um, Coach Holtz had, had talked highly of him. He was very well uh, regarded throughout the USFL from his two years with the Generals. And he was a guy who I really thought we would see a lot of this year, potentially be a starting lineman for us. But for whatever reason, um, Coach Holtz and the the staff decided that some of the other guys that they had uh, just better fit uh, the team and and what they plan to do this year. And so he was one that was, I think, definitely a, a surprise to some people, uh, as well as, you know, some of the others for sure. I, I know Channing Stribling is another all USFL guy, former all USFL guy that was was let go that people were, were sort of surprised by. Um, Traven Howard was a, a well-known sort of name, won a Super Bowl a few years ago with the Rams. So, again, the nature of the beast was that the Stans roster was so loaded. Whoever they let go, it was going to be a little bit of a head-scratcher and a little bit of a surprise because they – they didn't have any non-talented players to release. I mean, that that that's not how this roster has been constructed. So, um, unfortunately, we had to to move on for some guys, but I'm really hoping they land on their feet and uh, find a new opportunity, whether that's in this league or in a different league, and uh, certainly wishing them all the best. Um, our 58-man roster is now set. Again, I'll, I'll include a picture of that on the screen for us here, but um, if you, uh, you know, haven't been paying close attention, I think the 58 guys that we got are incredible um, we, we've got a loaded team. Um, sadly, we will have to move on from eight guys at some point uh, in about two weeks, specifically Saturday, March 23rd. We'll have to, to cut eight more guys to get down to a 50 man roster. But I think the the players that we have are, um, you know, very impressive. And I'm really excited to see this team on the field. Just a couple other things to finish up here. The Stallions did announce a Champions Night ticket package uh, for the home opener on April 13th, Saturday, April 13th against the Memphis Showboat. So you can uh, use the link that was shared on the Stallion social media page yesterday, and I'll include it in the notes on YouTube, that if you want to get both your game ticket and a sort of limited edition t-shirt, you can do that sort of, uh, you know, buy one, get one, so to speak. So if you haven't got your tickets yet to the home opener, I definitely jump on that. Um, supplies, I think, are limited, so get it before it's gone. Uh, if you haven't already got your tickets, or or maybe let your friends know if you've already got your tickets. Hey, there's a, a good deal for the home opener. It's going to be a night game. It's going to be fantastic atmosphere and uh, a big big game against a rival in Memphis. So you definitely want to be there for that. Also, another kind of exciting game thing. Um, if you're a baseball person, especially uh, something you should know. On May 11th, when we play the Battle Hawks, Blooper, the Braves mascot, is going to be coming to uh, that game, and it's going to be part of the Braves sort of tour that they do through the south, through the southeast, in kind of the sort of you know April May months where they kind of go around to other states and other cities and sort of advertise and, and drum up excitement for the Braves. And so one of the stops they're going to make is at the Stallions Battle Hawks game, and I think they're going to have obviously Blooper there and then also some other kind of promotional things and, and things for kids and families and all that sort of thing. So if you're a Braves fan, if you're a baseball fan, um, especially if you if you love them and the Stallions, this is a, a no-brainer. Make sure you, you mark it on your schedule to be there get for the Stallions Battle Hawks game, and you can um, you know get a picture, get, get your kids' picture with Stanley and with Blooper. And uh, it should be a great game, um, sort of a, a rivalry game of sorts. Um, there's been a lot of, of chatter between the Battle Hawks and Stallions this offseason, two kind of loud, big fan bases. And uh, A.J. McCarron will be back in his sort of homecoming in Alabama with the Battle Hawks. So that's that's not one you want to miss. And uh, Blooper being there, you know, that's just a, another reason to come. And then lastly, just one final fun thing here. Uh, Coach Holtz's birthday was actually yesterday, Tuesday, March 12th. So, uh, you know, you're a day late now if you forgot to wish him happy birthday. But uh, make sure you you wish Coach happy birthday. Let him know that we love him. We're thankful for him. We're excited for this season. And uh, we hope he had an awesome birthday. So that's it for the roundup. Again, I know there's a lot of information, but hopefully you find that helpful. And if there's anything I forgot, I'll try and make note of it elsewhere. Um, but thank you all again for tuning in. That's going to be it for this week's episode. Again, if you didn't listen to the emergency podcast that we had over the weekend covering the roster, definitely go back and check that out. If you missed a previous episode, we've covered uh, an interview with Zach Potter, the Stallions general manager. We had an interview in week two with Marlon Williams, Stallions wide receiver. And then last week with linebacker Chris Orr. Uh, both of those guys are 
also still on the roster and, and have really um, unique experiences. Marlins going into his third year with the Stallions. Chris Orr is going into his third year in spring football, but first year with the Stallions. And so all of these guys have a little bit different perspective on things. And I would definitely go back and check those out if you didn't get the opportunity to previously. But definitely appreciate you tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. Get ready because the season is inching closer. We're going to have some really exciting stuff lined up as we get closer to that March 30th kickoff date. I uh, hope to see you in Arlington at that game. If not, then certainly we'll see you in Birmingham for the home opener on April 13th. It's going to be fun. And make sure you remember, giddy up.